available now at whitepillbook.com. This episode is brought to you by Patriot Gold. Good afternoon, Michael Malice here. Let that be your welcome for the next hour. We have with us an episode that is exciting for two reasons. One is my returning longtime recurring guest. I think probably the most popular guest, at least certainly most frequent that I've had on your welcome because of our crossovers that we did throughout the COVID lockdowns. Comic Dave Smith, he is host of Far the Problem with Third Legion Skanks. His comedy special Libertas, which is over his left shoulder, right half of your screen, hit number one. Uh, and I just saw him recently in Austin when he performed another set, and I thought it was absolutely excellent. Um, Dave, I do think that you are like your new setup. You're like in the Twilight Zone room where there's like a clock flying through the air. There's your logo, and like that's it. Like, are you like in space right now? Dave I Smith, am, uh, by the way. I, by the way, I really love the intro. They go, yeah, you're most popular, if not most frequent. You're like, okay, maybe not most popular, but I make up for it in volume. Like, you may not like me that much, but I'm here a lot. So you'll get a lot. There's a lot. We both have a lot of haters. Oh, we all. Yeah, that's that's part of the game. By the way, I'm constructing. I was just uh, talking to your your uh, producer. I'm I'm constructing a studio actually right now, and it's almost done. So I'm very that's excited terrific. about that. But for now, it's this uh, wall where time stands still. And by the way, to my left, over my shoulder, is a painting I just got in the mail by Sal Official, who's a great artist. You should follow him on Instagram. Link. This, oh, that's very cool. Just his version of the cover of the white pill, which I was like, I absolutely love it. And his other painting of the anarchist handbook is hanging hanging right when you walk into my house. I wanted to give him a shout out here because the other funny thing, because I'm complete douche, like he it came here Thursday and I haven't acknowledged it at all. And I know he's probably checking my Instagram. <laughs> so I thought, all right, let's do a real shout out and have it be on the show. So I think it's great. It's, I think it's going to hang up right there uh, next. Yeah. Why would you? Why would you say something nice to his face and have a real human to human moment? When well, you don't you think it's nicer if you get a public shout out than like a little note? Definitely better for business. Yeah. So Sal. Uh, so anyway, um, Sal's official. Sal's famous official is his Instagram handle. If not, just double check the link in the show notes. Um, I we're going to be talking about an issue that has been normalized faster than you can say trans kids. I'm speaking, of course, of. <laughs> I, I, am I wrong? Uh, I'm speaking, of course, of national divorce. Now, earlier, uh, I think last week, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's everyone's favorite uh, crazy aunt who lives in the attic, she broached the subject. She said we need a national divorce using those term, that term. Her definition is not at all the definition I think that anyone uses it uses because her definition is like having the states divorced from Washington. It's like that's called federalism. That's not really a divorce. <laughs> But you and I have been discussing this for a long time. The article I wrote uh, kind of got this ball rolling in early or mid, I don't remember what it was, 2016. Uh, and it's also funny because this speaks to something I've addressed and you and I have discussed as well, which is I think most people, and I think especially conservatives, have no idea how culture develops. So conservatives are um, ide um, uh, psychologically just are, uh, don't have, are not big on the openness metric by definition. So they're not really particularly seeking out new and exciting things. That's not a knock on conservatism. Not everyone has to be skydiving and you know trying snails at the at the restaurant. If you want steaks and potatoes, you're not a bad person at all. Right. Uh, but as a result of this, they're not going to see things may, maybe coming up on the horizon as opposed to someone like a hipster who's always looking for that next new thing. And as a result of this, they don't have, in my opinion, any uh, even a theory of how culture develops. It's like, oh, the, the liberals, the left, captured the universities, captured the movies. It's like, when were these not the left? And what was the process of capturing them? And why aren't you mimicking this process? It, it was clearly effective. Or is your argument that you can't mimic it because it works for them, it weren't for you, but you don't have this discussion. It's like, oh, here's something new out of nowhere, defund the police. It's like, no, these ideas percolate through the culture, through, you know, I think there was some article I read that like the time from like some crazy Tumblr post to a democratic politician advocating it was like 20 months. It was something crazy like that. Uh, and now we're seeing it from the fringes of at least the non-left, you know, seeping into the public consciousness. Uh, were you surprised? I, that's my long way of setting up. Were you surprised? And what was your reaction when you heard that from Marjorie Taylor Greene? I wasn't surprised because I've heard her talk about the, the this issue before. Um, but I was, I, I am 
more broadly speaking, very surprised how mainstreamed this idea has become. Yeah. How, I mean, I remember, ta- you know, me and you talking about this even before you wrote that piece in 2016. And I don't even know if we were using the term national divorce, but just saying the idea of, of the United States breaking up. And, and yeah. the, I, I remember talking to people about this concept of like mass secession. And I'm hearing feedback a lot. And I'm not hearing you, any. You know? Okay. Okay. Fine. Um, so, but this was considered, I mean, like you might as well suggest that maybe Martians could come down and be our government. It was just considered so insane back in 2014, 2015 or something like that. And now, even though there's certainly a lot of people who are rejecting it, they're discussing it. And the idea just doesn't seem so, so crazy. And it's a, you see a real push in the Overton window. And I'll say, if nothing else, I, I will say, I don't think that there is going to be a successful secession anytime very soon in America. I think it's unlikely, like, say, in the next few years that this happens. Not impossible, but unlikely. But one of my favorite things about this topic of the national divorce is just kind of like, the thought experiment that it forces people to play, yes. The, yes. the way it forces people to start thinking, it, it forces them to start um, taking some things that they uh, uh, took as givens and re-examining them. Like, why is it so clear? And and you start to realize that there there's a very weak logical footing for being opposed to this. I mean, like, it's almost like you, you just like very basically you go like, so what are you saying? If you're saying that it w- it's such a disaster if America were to split up into two countries or three countries, are you saying then logically that we should merge with Canada and then we should also merge with Mexico and have one world government? Would that be better than what we have? Or are you saying just by chance we are divided into the perfect, like geographically, we figured out the perfect number of countries in the world and this is the optimal system. And then if you're like a conservative or a right winger, you're like, this is the optimal system. You sure about that? Like, look around. This is what you think is producing the best results. And it, it kind of forces people to just ponder, like, well, why exactly are we one country? Is the fact that we're one country a net positive or a net negative for what your goals are? And all of these thoughts, like, to me, it's just really good to see people even, like, thinking about these things, whether they're uh, falling on one side or the other. Yeah, there's a tactic that progressives use very effectively which and Trump used this as well, and it's amazing to what extent people of all political persuasions are. You know, there's this thing called face blindness, like where you don't remember people's faces. Like this is a tactic people that is commonly used, and some people are like are completely blind to it and they can't register it. Right? They just take everything at face value, which is this. Like, let's suppose I uh, want a massive cut in income tax, which is never going to happen. Like, let's just add a cream. And I normalize the idea of abolishing the income tax and repealing the amendment. Yeah, I don't, I, that maybe that's what I want, but that's a great way to get people to be like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Before we abolish the IRS, how about we just, you know, introduce a flat, t- you know what I mean? So that is a technique that is very commonly used. And people are like, oh my God. Nas-. So even worst case scenario that national divorce is not happening, once you have a significant, and by significant, I mean 5%. Once you have a significant part of the population who are like, there's nothing you can say that's going to make me want to be a part of a country with you any longer, you have to start negotiating because they're not messing around. Their foot's out the door. In, in, in any relationship, right? If there's like a marriage and someone drops the word or a boyfriend, girlfriend, maybe we should start seeing other people. Once you throw that out there, you can't unring that bell, especially if the person is serious about it. So in and of itself, it's a useful tactic insofar as it's being used sincerely as i am very sincerely using it to force people like wait wait wait, we don't have as much control of this as we thought because they really see that they have alternatives look at it this way let's suppose i'm working for you and i want a 20 percent raise right what if instead of just asking you for that i have another job offer that's giving me a 20 percent raise which position would i rather be in and if you had both of those bits of information a what options does he have as opposed to wait he's got an offer in hand your position is going to be very different from mine that's one two is if we're at the point where people are like well what's it going to look like then i feel that my work is done because as a car like a car salesman if if you're like well can i afford this what color cars do you have the hardest part is done which is now psychologically they're over the hump of wanting to buy a car. They're, now they're figuring out if they can, which is a very, very different state to be. 
Scott Adams. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Scott Adams, uh, <laughs> <laughs> who has been having an interesting, interesting week of, of late, um, made this point about how Hillary Clinton during the 2016 campaign made a fatal error because she kept saying to people, imagine Donald Trump in the White House and this is happening, this is happening. And he's like, the biggest hurdle was yeah. that people couldn't imagine this talk show host loudmouth bore in the Oval Office and you're making them imagine it. And normalizing that idea, you've just made it so much easier for them to be like, okay, I can pull the, 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 the lever for this guy. I've imagined it, him in the Waffle Office already. This is not impossible to me. So I think those are some major, major steps forward. And the other thing why I think it's so great that it's become normalized is instead of people being like, this is a bad idea or whatever, it very quickly becomes threats, right? So if, if for example, you and I have our little crossover shows, and one day I'm like, Dave, you know what? I'm not comfortable with these. Uh, I don't think we should do them anymore. And you're like, oh, okay. Well, I'm just going to come to your house and burn it down and then kill you. Now, there's part of me would be like, okay, let me con reconsider. Because <laughs> if that is actually a possibility, then I'm, I really better be sure I don't want to do the crossovers. But there's a bigger part, which is long term, if I'm in some kind of relationship with this guy who's ready to kill me, if I'm not being uh, under his thumb, I really need to have an exit plan because this is not a sustainable situation. Right. And and that doesn't mean that um, there's not something there that you should be concerned about. Like if you were like, oh, like, OK, you're in an abusive relationship and you're like, if you try to leave, the guy will kill you. It's like, oh, OK, well, then we really got to figure out a way to make sure that guy doesn't kill you. But it's also pretty clear at that point that you're like, but we got to figure out a way for you to leave because <laughs> like this is not the answer isn't just like, well, then I guess you got to stay married to this guy forever. I mean, he'll make kill it you work. If you leave. So, yeah, this make, is a make right? it work moment. So, and it's there, there's two almost this is what's one of the things that I find really why I love this topic so much is because it does. It brings out these kind of knee jerk responses from people yeah. that you're like, whoa, that's fascinating. Like, let's examine what you just said here. So Wait, what a can lot I interrupt? of it's sure, not just sure. knee jerk. It's what they've been programmed to since yeah. they're kids, because we're all taught that secession was solved legally in the Civil War and that the only reason someone wants to secede is because of slavery. And yeah. so they just just blurt out the narrative that from their childhood. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Dave. Well, yeah. And, and, and just to be very clear about this, I do agree to some uh, uh, at least to some extent that it's a very big concern like a yes. big concern is like 100%. if some small group tried to secede from the united states of america i think it's quite possible that the federal government would try to violently put them down which no was question. really what the civil war was about for the north um you know for the south i think a lot of it was about you know this tradition of slavery um but for the north it was really first and foremost about we cannot let people secede like you don't have this option you know yeah. the whole you know, dress it up however you want to you know United we stand, divided we fall. But it was like, no, you're not leaving. You can't leave. And so it's quite possible they would they would attempt to do that. But so that's a big concern. But the the reaction that people have where they're like, well, this would just lead to war. You're you're advocating for war if you're advocating for a national divorce. And you're like, okay, well, let's just break this down for a second. If you're saying there's almost two uh, options of what you could be saying here. Number one is you're saying that the what's remaining of the United States of America's federal government would violently squash it if people wished to secede from in order so, to preserve democracy. Right. So the, the, the question to that is like, OK, do you support that? Like, do you support yeah, if there right, was a personally. group of people, say there was 100 people who are just like, we don't want to be America anymore. We want to build our own little government here on our own private property. Would you support them being violently squashed? Like, you know, like, OK, so if, you, if the answer to that is yes, then we're not really having a conversation anymore. But if the answer to that is no, then OK, so let's think about what's the best way to do this. And the other possibility is that they, they kind of argue that, well, if we're all just not, you know, in under one federal umbrella, we'll end up going to war with each other. Like the two areas that have seceded will end up going to war with each other, which also kind of implies that the only thing that's stopping us from murdering each other is what? Joe Biden and Nancy right. Pelosi having control over us, that if it wasn't for that, you can't see any way that like Texas and Arizona could, could live, maybe not perfectly harmoniously but not murdering each other like i and, and th so to me this just seems to be a very strange view particularly for like conservative types or libertarian types to not think that there would like be some kind of like uh that that maybe tradition 
and customs would govern to some degree and not simply the right. fact that we have this old constitution in Washington, D.C. that we all know no one pays attention to right. anyway. It's, it's just it's, it's really, um, to me, a very bizarre thing. I, I do think that we could concede that, it, you know, this is like one of the things I think in general that happens when you argue for anarchy is people almost come up with everything that could possibly go wrong. And then and therefore we need government. Whereas like really a fuller uh, uh, examination of this would be, well, here's what is more likely to go wrong versus what's likely to go wrong under a government, which or, one is preferable, which one is more likely to happen. Or, or the fact that you're comfortable with it happening under a government, but when it happens under anarchism, somehow it's a problem. So it's like, well, under anarchism, you'd have murder and rape. So that's why we need to have a government. It's like, but we have that. <laughs> like, right. like it's and, not... and, and no one, and even if someone's painting this uh, extreme you know, uh, uh, um, theoretical about what could go wrong under anarchy. Like this could happen. Yeah. Or this could happen. Some people could do this awful thing. It's like, well, okay, but look, I mean, under a government, some people could commit a genocide, right? Like we've seen that happen. So even if you're arguing for a government, you're arguing for a government a certain way. You're not yeah. just arguing for any government will do. And, and much like with this, with the idea of national divorce, like, yeah, it would have to be done in a certain way. There are there are several things that would have to happen that would be very, very important to happen. Like, number one, you would have to um, get as large of public support for it as you could possibly have. You're going to need something in the range of like 80 percent of people in that area wanting to secede. It's not going to work if you have 51 percent of people who, who want to secede. You're going to have to get like an overwhelming majority. And number two, you're going to have to um, be incredibly respectful of the rights of the people who dissented. It is not going to work if Texas seceded from the United States of America right. and then Texas started like violently abusing the 20 percent of Texans who didn't want to secede. That's going to be a justification for others to to invade and come in. And, oh, we have to do this for the rights of those people. Wait, so but they're, gonna, they, they're not going to have any if they want a justification, they'll find one. I mean, well, that's... yes, but you but you st that might be true, but you still don't want to hand them an easy one and you don't sure. want to hand them an easy one that could be sold very easily. So I think there's like lots of things that would have to happen in order for this to become a reality. But the the like to me, when it comes down to it, it's like the bottom line of all of this is like, what is the role of the federal government of the United States of America right now? Is this a net positive or a net negative compared to what state governments uh, are doing or could possibly do if they had full sovereignty? And I think you're going to it's going to be a very tough argument to argue that what the federal government right now for the prospects of liberty or sanity or stability or just pure civilization is not a tremendous net negative. Right now, they, like overwhelmingly worse than anything any state government could get away with on its own. It, a state government might uh, slide uh, be somewhat tyrannical. It's not going to have the world's reserve currency. It's not going to um, it's not going to bomb seven countries in 20 years into oblivion. It's not going to be able to spend its its uh, people 30 trillion dollars into debt. It's not yeah. going to be able to, um, you know, uh, um, provoke a war in Eastern Europe that could lead to the next world war. And then, like it's just not going to. It's not going to have a federal reserve system in the same capacity that we have when it controls all of the United States of America. It's it's capa the, their capacity for evil will be greatly diminished from what we currently have. Now, Dave, one of the things that you and I are both concerned about when it comes to national divorce is keeping your money safe and secure. And a great way to hedge against inflation and the Fed is through buying gold. And I want to talk to you a bit about Patriot Gold. Now, BlackRock is warning us to prepare for a recession unlike any other in history has shown that the only way the Fed can fight inflation is with a recession. And everyone's New Year's resolution is to buy gold and silver. Over 80% of retirees are concerned about inflation. In 2008, the stock market and housing market crashed. Meanwhile, gold went from $800 an ounce to $1,600 an ounce over the next two and a half years. Big banks and billionaires agree on two things. One, we're heading toward a recession. Food price, price is going through the roof. It's problems getting stuff on your shelves. And two, investors need to buy gold, which several analysts are predicting will hit some all-time highs. It's the only capital that will be worth holding if shit hits the fan. And what else can you invest in that will hold its line? The Patriot Gold Group is introducing the 2023 Recession Protection No Fee for Life IRA. Call the Patriot Gold Group today before it's too late. You don't want to be that person looking over your 401k crying, and you'll get best-in-class service from Patriots Protecting Patriots. 
Patriot Gold Group has the no fee for life IRA where your IRA or 401k can be in physical gold and silver. And you may be eligible for the no fee for life IRA on qualifying rollovers. All you got to do is call 888-505-9845 to get a free investor guide today. Mention my name, Michael Malice, or go to malicegold.com. Patriot Gold Group is Consumer Affairs top rated gold IRA dealer six years in a row. So call 888-505-9845 or go to malicegold.com. I, I it's and it's really fun for me because I, I when I put the because Thomas Sowell, you know, who you and I both adore, had this comment about how there's no solutions, there's only trade offs, right? Right. So I'm surprised and delighted that no one is calling this utopian, like they call anarchism. So they're they're at least recognizing that it's certainly realistic. I had a poll and and just forcing people to think in these terms, I think really nudges them in this direction, which is which do you think is more likely? that the federal government returns to what it was in 2019, four years ago. Now it's 6 trillion, it used to be 4.5. So that's a cut of 25% just for four years ago, which is more likely that it's gonna get cut to 4.5 trillion or that Texas has allowed its independence. And everyone was like, all right, these are both extremely unlikely, but the first one is as close to literally impossible as you, you can think of. Like right. there's no now reason- do- now do uh 1776 you know <laughs> like now do now do like actually returning to just following its own you know uh declaration of independence or something right like so that. when you put in those terms like okay this is no longer that crazy second it acknowledges them that whatever they're thinking about like let's just go back to the constitution uh let's just vote in the right people all, all these other things there's no incentives in washington to shrink the government at all no matter Republican or Democrat, Mitch McConnell just got revoted in. Kevin McCarthy got voted in, except for a few handouts. These are not men who have any interest whatsoever in cutting the federal government by their own admission. There wasn't even the slightest bit of an attempt. So, and the other thing is, I had some veterans. This is the funny ones, where they're like, you know, I'm not going to give up an inch to the communists. And I'm like, what is your model? And this is a serious question for reclaiming Portland. Are you going to do like a reverse reconstruction where like you have a strongman president and 60 MAGA Republican senators and they're going to have troops holding Portland under federal occupation? Like are you going to go there and start talking to them and they got the Constitution at Philadelphia? Like there's not even a hypothetical model of getting there, whereas the model for national divorce Although unlikely, the steps are pretty clear. There's a referendum in Texas, which is already going to be is already part of the Republican platform here in Texas. Governor Abbott, whoever, as a sociopath, as all politicians are, realize, wait a minute, I could be president of Texas, its own country, one going to be one of the biggest countries in the world, as opposed to governor of, of Texas. Okay, I'm going to go for it. And in Washington, they're like, all right, we we can't. We don't have the the reason, the willpower, the resources, to do anything about it. It happens. That's the okay. That's so I'll that. give I'll I'll give one slight bit of pushback. Although I I ultimately agree. I think there is one model of getting there for how it could happen, um, and that model is so bad that it would be such a it would be a much worse problem than what we currently live under. But yes, there's a model for yeah. how you could actually say we're not going to give up one inch to the commies. Okay. And you'd need something like the denazification program that they had in Germany right. after right. World War II. But you're talking about ruthlessly murdering innocent civilians, like murdering just people, and you're going to get a whole lot of the wrong people too. And just an un- like the, the only model for taking back Portland, the only model for weeding out all of the leftists from every university and from every inch of Hollywood and from every, is like, a level of authoritarianism that we've never actually seen in this country. And if you ever got that, you'd be looking at a much worse problem than what we have right now. So by every metric, but, except yes. for ideologically, maybe. Well, yeah, and even ideologically, because these right. things maybe, tend to devolve maybe. into, you know, like yeah. into their own problems. So uh it's basically, and this is what it's it's I understand the impulse of people to say this. It's like, you know. But it's almost like if you were invaded by an army of 100,000 people and you have a 1,000 fighters and they're like taking your whole city and you're like, okay, we're going to retreat back to this one building and defend this building. And you're like, no, I don't want to give an inch to these guys. Like, okay, that's a nice idea. But right here, given reality, your choices basically are between radical decentralization or radical totalitarianism like those those are the only real options in terms of like something like we're going to take back the culture what would that even mean what culture are you returning to when when was the culture something you liked it wasn't in your lifetime 
Yeah, certainly wasn't. And what you're thinking about right before your lifetime is just something you're imagining that wasn't even that. I'm not even saying there might have been aspects that were preferable about the culture, but there was probably lots of other things that really weren't uh, great. Also, this is the the truth is that there's it's almost like you have to have a recognition uh, like a red pill, a red pilling or, or of sorts about how bad the current situation really is, what you're really up against. And not live in a fantasy about it and realize like, oh, yeah, it's actually that bad. And, and we're getting worse. That's the important yes. thing. It's not like, OK, after, you know, we, we have to go through this Great Depression, but after it, it's going to be a booming economy and, and everyone's going to go to college and have fulfilling jobs that they acknowledge that there's not this train is not getting even stopped, let alone turned around. And, and look at how much the um, the kind of radical progressives still control the narrative and control the Overton window. I mean, you know, Ron DeSantis will come out and support, you know, the whole don't say gay thing or whatever, where he's like, you can't sexually indoctrinate our children until the fourth grade. <laughs> Like it's good. You can't do it until the fourth grade. And this is like the most controversial thing that gets all of this pushback. I mean, even that, does anyone think that if that was passed nationwide, that would have, that would even slow down this? Do you even like, even if, so, so take like the most, what is the most radical toxic proposal in the country over the last year and, and make it national law. It still does nothing. It hasn't even begun to to slow down, you know, the 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 direction we're going in. So what what is the realistic hope of anything else? And the other thing I'll say is that I think, you know, I've heard a lot of people make this this point um, or, or, or kind of this line of argument that, well, the problem, like I've heard libertarians who oppose the national well, divorce part idea. Of the part of the problem. Uh, so the, the I've heard libertarians who oppose national divorce that will often say, like, well, if you give the, you know, if you break the country up into like, you know, red areas and blue areas, then you get the worst of the red policies and the worst of the blue policies, you know? And it's almost as if, like where I think they're really missing the mark is it's almost like they're saying the real problem in America is left-wing Americans and right-wing Americans. But that's not the core of the problem. The real core of the problem is the center establishment who yeah. kind of pits both of those groups against each other and and pushes the most destructive policies on these people this is one of the things that really frustrates me um about a lot of uh conservatives and right wingers is when they refer to kind of like their enemies as the left you turn the left you, you know, you turn, again. <laughs> you, well you turn on like sean hannity yeah. and he's always yeah. like the far left nancy pelosi that like if you ever actually talk to some far left winger and you well, say the far they, left Nancy the Pelosi, it's one of the reasons I wrote the white pill because they yeah. kept talking about communism, and I'm like, D Joe Biden's a communist. I'm like, do you do you have any idea what that is? It's I, I mean he's so clearly in the pockets of corporate America. Now you can yeah. say he's an authoritarian, you can say he's a big government guy, you can say you know he's part of he's a figurehead for something broader. That that's probably not only true yeah, but and disputable. I'm, this guy does not want the government running like textile mills. Yes, and I'm not even against you calling him a communist if that's a way to like whip up popular support yeah. against him because you feel uh, I I don't really think it particularly works with the younger generation. I no. think it probably gets boomers real angry at him or something like that because that word still kind of holds weight to them whatever you know fine but if we're just talking about what's actually going on here you're like no no no. this is not there hasn't been some like communist revolution in america it's the same interests i mean down to like the big banks and the freaking new york times and all they all lined up behind george w bush and were pushing his war in iraq and his yep. whole war on terrorism they're the same interests they started wearing this shell of like cultural commie racialist type language because that worked for them more in the in the second term of obama and through the trump term and, and up to today but there it's it's really the center establishment like it's not like you're far left that's why i saw people where they were like you know because they just had that big anti-war rally in uh in uh washington dc that like the libertarian party and the forward uh party like there was, there was like some like commies and some libertarians all uh in an anti-war rally and it's kind of like a lot of people are like they're like oh you know you're so you're working with those communists oh they're pushing all this like transgender ideology and stuff like that and you're like no they're not that's not what they're about 
Those right. guys are like, they hate the woke shit. They think it's a distraction from like the workers taking over the factories and shit. They're like, what are you talking about? I don't care if your kid's a boy or a girl or nothing like that. I want to have health care and whatever, you know, like they're. I want to be able to feed your kid. Yeah, right. So their issue is it, in the people who are pushing like the radical, like um, transgender stuff on children, they, almost every one of them supports the war in Ukraine. It's oh, yeah. all coming from like the kind of like establishment yeah. perspective. And those those guys, I think, are the real enemies of the American people. It's like the corporate press and the political establishment yeah. and the banking and the industrial complex, yeah. the universities, the medical industrial complex, the pharmaceutical company, like the, the power sources that wield their power through their relationships with the federal government. That's what we're trying to break up. If left wingers want to live under a, a, a culture that's one way and right wingers under a different culture. I think the more that we approximate that, the closer it is to an approximation of liberty. It's never going to be perfect until you have secession down to the individual, which is essentially our, our anarchist you know, worldview. But it's going to be better the smaller it gets. So here's one that drives me crazy, this criticism, which is the, the concept of invasion, right? So I'll, I'll, if you, people, I would encourage everyone watching this to read Jonathan Haidt's book, The, um, the Righteous Mind, because once you read it, you can't see politics the same way, and it, he's not politically aligned in one way or another uh, in the book whatsoever. But the point being, like, people will start with their conclusion, their reason, their way backwards, right? So let's suppose the big Supreme Court case uh, with the New Deal, where there was a farmer growing grain on his own soil to feed his livestock. And this was he was fined or sued, whatever it was, because it was violating. And the argument was it violates interstate commerce. And it's like, I'm not selling it. It's on my property for my animals. There's no. And, and the argument was, well, you could have sold it. So because you could have sold it, it affected the price, therefore it affects interstate commerce, right? So the other big critique I have, I hear of national divorce is invasion. And it, it really drives me to distraction for several reasons. Because first of all, you go, are you telling me that if America was split into two countries of 175 million each, right away the Chinese are going to be in San Francisco and Fort Lauderdale? A and they're like, there's a couple of things. Well, it's an invasion, but they don't need to invade because they're already here. And I'm like, okay, so what's going to be easier for them to capture? D.C. or D.C. and Austin, where you have a bunch of Texans with very nationalist views? And then it's like, well, uh, hello, we're already being invaded from the south. Like Mexico sends X amount of people. And I'm like, okay, are you using that term invasion in the same way as you're using it from like, you know, China sends over all streets like Japan went to Pearl Harbor. Do you really think all these Mexicans or illegal immigrants like overnight can be radicalized, taking up arms like and they vacillate between those two ther those terms? Canada has like 30 million people. Great Britain <laughs> has 100 million. I don't know how many Taiwan has. It's certainly not a big number. I don't know how many Afghanistan has. They kicked their ass. The premise that if we split into two overnight china is going to invade is deranged just deranged this is a relic of cold warism number one the other one i hear is if we got uh, that happened half the country would cheer on while china invaded the other half and i'm like i'm sorry if china invaded canada with trudeau i don't think there's a single conservative in america or maybe there's a few i'm sorry who would be like well too bad they would be like yeah even <laughs> yeah even the most non-interventionist libertarian like myself would be like, yeah, I think that's the line. <laughs> like, you know, it's, I think, right. I think that's the, that's probably the line. Like, you and know, also they, the they, other thing though, if it's the, if it's red state America for the hypothetical is invaded, do you really think the blue state war machine wouldn't see this as an opportunity that they'd be just like, oh yeah, fine, conquer them. It's going to be half Northern America and half China. We're just fine yeah, with this. I, yeah, so purely out of not out of empathy or anything, just right. out of self-preservation that there wouldn't be. But I mean, look, dude, this is look, the idea of like invasion, like traditional conventional invasion from China is just this is just not a serious like uh, discussion. I mean, it's a, it? take me take me through the war games and you show me. So what are they doing exactly? They're sailing over the Pacific, coming over here Secretly. to invade our country. Secretly. Yeah. But then yeah, the other is... argument is like they can nuke us. It's like they could do it now. Like like right. that wouldn't that's a wash.
Yes. No, the, no, that that's obviously a wash. Now, in terms of like if, you know, obviously now the, I know there's right wingers who like to use the term invasion for like uh, mass uh, migration. OK, but at least we recognize we're talking about two different things. If you're talking about a conventional military invasion or mass flooding in of 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 um, immigration or illegal immigration or whatever it may be. It's like, OK, well, look at the numbers of that now. I mean, I think we're there are over 200,000 border apprehensions uh, a month right now. So how, how many of them are coming in? We don't know. That's just right. the border apprehensions. So this is happening all over the place. And essentially, I think this almost comes down to the this is the essence of the pitch for national divorce, which I understand is a bitter pill to swallow for people who still hold out hope of saving the United States of America, even though they have no plausible path of how to get there. Um, but like, OK, so what we're offering you is not you can save the United States of America, but you could save Texas. You know what I mean? Like you could, it, Texas can now come up with its own immigration policy. And what do you think that's going to be in Texas? And if California wants to keep the doors wide open, okay, that California is going to be flooded with, and okay, maybe that will put some pressure on California where they can't just, um, they can't just uh, like push these costs off on everybody else. And they actually have to bear them themselves. They've been bearing a lot of costs and so far it hasn't pushed them to do that, but at least you can go into your, uh, you know what I mean? Like into your state and hopefully ultimately your locality, your town, your, you know, County and be able to come up with policies that best represent what the people there want. Um, I, I think that uh, again, there's this tendency it's kind of like this psychological dynamic where if you're so let's say you're at a job, you're working in a job that you hate and you're just miserable at this job and you're you're someone's trying to convince you you got to quit your job and go for it in the field that you love. And what comes to mind already uh, right away are all the risks. But what if I don't get a job and what if I don't make money and what if I'm like I have all of a sudden and it's much easier, but it's much easier to ignore. What are the risks of staying? Yeah. What are the risks involved in staying and doing? And the risk is having cost, a miserable right. life, right? And but you're already doing that, so it's just it's human. It, it's something in our natural, like adaptive, you know, yeah. genetics that we go. Well, I've already accepted this as a possibility. So one of the other things that I see people argue a lot, which comes like right after the invasion thing. Right before you is, don't change that, because let me just sorry. add one more point about invasion, sure, sure, sure. which is I had this other tweet, which caused the boomer to spurg out, where I said, once Texas becomes independent, we're going to have to be more worried about our northern border than our southern. And someone's like, blah, 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 blah. and it's just like, yeah, I'm more worried once that happens of what Washington is going to do than what Mexico City is going to do, like period. Right. And I don't think that's even hard to wrap your head around. And I think that's extremely realistic. Yeah, well, it's funny to see even like, I, I mean, this is why like I'm not an open borders uh, uh, libertarian, but there's a lot of open borders libertarians. But it's interesting to see where a lot of the uh, the kind of contradictions of all of, of that stuff comes into as I, I I went back and forth with someone who was in the the free state project which i love by the way um of course, they were arg this was like over a year ago but they were arguing with me about open borders and you're just at a point you're like your your whole game is geographic relocation with the purpose of concentrating with like-minded people so like you you get there's there's an issue there right like just just what was their response well I don't know that, you know, something about, well, we could have other, it was not a completely unfair response. It was something okay. like we could have other methods other than laws of keeping people out, developing a culture where they wouldn't want to be here. So, you know, like there's an argument to it, but at least you'd still grant that like, yeah, there's a point that this like, especially under a democracy, this really changes things when people are allowed to. Uh, Here's one that really ways. drives me crazy when they're like, this can't work because, and speaks to what you just said, this can't work because you'd have blue cities and red areas and red areas and blue states and people aren't going to get what they want i'm like as opposed to now right like, it's, like it's, literally it's, it's like no one's saying we're going to start a country from scratch and we're just going to have large pockets you know pockets of, that are going to be unrepresented if you're happy with it now you can't say it's a problem when it's going to be the same thing it just goes back to the same old Thomas Sowell thing. It's compared to what? You yeah. can't just discuss this in a vacuum and say, uh, which is what they do with anarchy all the time. Well, aha, it's not perfect. Therefore, forget the whole thing. Therefore, the, the status quo. It's like, yes, we're going to have blue cities and red uh, like suburbs or rural areas. It's like, yeah, like we do right now. And you're like, well, there's no perfectly clean way to divide things up if we have a national divorce. And you're like, 
What, are you telling me it's perfect that Puerto Rico, America, Hawaii, and Alaska are part of the United States of America? Like, yeah, we divided things up already in a random way. Or, like, or talk to arbitrary. someone. Or talk to someone from downstate Illinois who have absolutely yeah. no voice in Chicago. Or talk to someone, uh, you know, the, uh, someone in um, Arkansas who's like a hardcore lefty. What are they going to do? Nothing. They have right. no representation. So, so you constantly get this, and uh, you constantly get the, these two dynamics. Either instead of comparing this idea to the status quo, we just look at the imperfections of this idea, or you're hyper focused on all of the concerns of this idea while ignoring the concerns of of continuing with yeah. the status quo. Hey, folks, your welcome is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Now, whether you love true crime or comedy, celebrity interviews, news, or even motivational speakers, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue, right? And guess what? Now you can call the shots on your auto insurance, too. Enter the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. The Name Your Price tool puts you in charge of your auto insurance by working just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance. Then they'll show you a variety of coverages that fit within your budget, giving you options. Now, that's something you want to press play on. It's easy to start a quote, and you'll be able to choose the best option for you fast. It's just one of the many ways you can save with Progressive Insurance. Quote today at Progressive.com to try the Know Your Price tool for yourself and join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates, price and coverage match limited by state law. Let's get back to the show. So another one that I hear people talk about a lot is they'll say um, w w the trade issue, which I, I'm much more uh, sympathetic to uh, in theory because I'm, I'm not an open borders guy, but I am a complete free trade you know, proponent. I think free trade is wonderful and, and you know, in, uh, leads to wealthier societies. So they go, well, I mean, let's say we had 50 states. Now you could have 50 different tariff policies or 50 different protectionist policies or something <laughs> yeah, like that. Countries don't exist already, right? Right. Like, well, it, it well, you go look. The the argument essentially is right, and this is I think a sound economic argument that uh, that protectionist policies make goods more expensive. Yes, um, and that's true, and that is true, and and uh, cheap consumer goods is what allows people to raise up their standard of living. Um, and you could just look at that, see like how much inflation has been wiping people out, right? When things yeah. get more expensive, it really hurts the poor and the middle class and really it wipes them out. I mean, you know, like it's really horrible, you know, pe people who like, uh, have make 70 grand a year used to be like, Oh, you had a real, you have a really good job. And now if you make 70 grand a year and have two kids, you're like, you're drowning, you know? Um, so yes, we want, but the, the thing is like, again, it has to be compared to what? So you compare it to staying under the current federal model. Well, what is the biggest, um, what is the biggest cost for working class and middle class families right now? It's the freaking income tax, man. Yeah. This is what's destroying them. So yeah, the cost of staying together might be a raise in the income tax at some point. And like, oh my God, that wipes people out. And the other thing that so I- So they're getting people, it from both ends. They're getting it before they even see their paycheck. And then right. when they're trying to go to story, they're getting cut from inflation. Right, exactly. And so the you look at the inflation that's created by the federal government. You look at the the income tax that's that's uh, you know uh, enforced by the federal government. And then you also the other aspect to it is that, and I think a lot of people miss this. This is a point that Hans Hermann Hoppe um, makes. But that if you if you think about like if you take it to its logical conclusion, and he used the example of uh, Liechtenstein, which is I think there's like forty thousand people. In Liechtenstein, it's like the richest area in the world. I think the at the median income is yep. like two hundred grand a year or something like that. And he goes, "Well, why is it that you don't see any talk of um, uh, protectionism in Liechtenstein?" He goes, "Because it's forty thousand people. Like they, they all starve to death. Like everyone knows you can't possibly not have free trade with the world. With so the smaller you get, in fact, the more overwhelming the economic incentives are to trade with with the rest of the world because you just obviously with the smaller numbers you have, you're not going to be producing everything you need, but you can produce a lot of one thing and then trade it out with other people. Or Singapore is so, another I, example. Yep. Yes. Yes. Another great example. And so you go and 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 then also the understanding that you know. Uh, which is a point that you make quite often, which is that the idea that we're governed by things that are written down on pieces of paper is actually right. a fairy tale. And in fact, we're really governed by precedent. And we're really governed by things like, well, the last guy did it and got away with it. Yep. So I think I can do it and get away with it. And tradition 
governs human beings much more than anything that's written down on a piece of paper. In fact, in every single state in the United States of America, they have laws on the books that are ridiculous laws that they never got off the books that they don't enforce at all. And, and so we, I'm and just, just, just to fi finish this, we have a tradition of trading and traveling within these 50 states. And there's no reason to assume that that immediately goes away because the laws on the books from the federal government go away. And it's hard for Americans to wrap their heads around this. And in fact, in the last five years, I had to have Tom Woods explain it to me because it wasn't making sense. We're so used to a constitution being something written down that delineates what the federal government can and supposedly can't do and what it's going to look like and so on and so forth. The British talk about the con their constitution all the time. And I'm like, Tom, what do they mean? And he goes, it literally just means they're like traditions. And it's just like, wait, how do you violate it? a constitution if it's not in writing and it's just like well we did this at one time this other time it's like he's like yeah that's so the idea the american um revelation or experiment was that let's have it all codified in writing as opposed to kind of like us just kind of having this oral or you know it's still written but not codified in one document history so the idea of a constitution to your point isn't what we think of it historically it has also been just our our ways of doing things in our traditions and and having things that we can reference to precedent as opposed to literally a document where you could like, OK, uh, check your notes against what it says there. And, and if you if you think about this, um, it's there's this is all around us, like all the time, like oh, there's yeah, ways of, of living. You you specific, you really see this the, if you go uh, live in a small town where there's just like ways of interacting with people. It's not a rule or a law. It's not written down everywhere. But yeah. we all know that we do this. We all know that we wave to each other when we pass. And we all know that we say, you know what I mean? It's just like things that are just customs and traditions. And but I'm personally not like opposed to codifying things like uh, sure. on written it's just i think clearly the constitution has demonstrated that that's not nearly enough that that in itself is not going to actually maintain any of these these rules and it's it, it is interesting to think about like just look empirically at what's happened in america it's like yeah it's it's like what's written down on the constitution doesn't really matter what matters is what the last guy did and whether or not he got away with it and if he did then there's really no precedent to prosecute the next guy for doing it is there and that's that the other thing that drives me crazy is this premise, which is not just in the case of national divorce, but also regard to anarchism, the idea that if there's a small, like weak area, it's prime for invasion. And I'm just like the, the, that if for that, if that hypothesis were true, that would mean that small, weak countries don't exist. Right. And it's like, there's more than you can count more than you can name. Literally, there are several countries that don't even have a military and they go, Oh, okay. But in that case, you know, America would invade and protect them. And it's like, okay, America's just wiped off the face of the earth tomorrow, right? Let's pretend, right? Someone invades somewhere. You're saying the remnants of NATO and Canada or these other powerhouses or even China itself or Russia or whoever uh, is just going to be like, eh, that's possible, but that it's a given that territorial sovereignty won't be defended and enforced internationally to me is, is nuts. And frankly, I don't even think China is that big on the idea that like territories don't exist and basically whoever invades anybody else, it, like if South Korea invades North Korea, China is not going to be like, well, you know, who cares? Borders are an out outmoded concept. <laughs> They're going to be like, hell no, get the F out of there. Yeah, there's also something interesting about this, like, um, it's kind of like the inverse of the point that you're making. But if you're saying that small countries get invaded by bigger countries, then in stated differently, what you're saying is big countries have a tendency to be tyrannical and invade smaller countries. Therefore, we should be a big country. And we have been the big country that has, I mean, if you want to put up, even, even give, give uh, Putin full blame for invading Ukraine and give him the highest end of the most exaggerated estimate of death counts right now. Let's go through the last 20 years and say, who's invaded more countries and killed more people, uh, America, China, or Russia? And like, it's not even close. We're, we're out in front by a lot. And I know that this is like, you know, uh, an area that makes conservatives uncomfortable because to some degree, there's always got to be this bedrock of like, we're the good guys, even as our institutions are trying to poison your children to hate you. We're still somehow the good guys. But it's like, there's just no objective metric where you can say that that's true. It's just not, it's not the case. And, you know, obviously then I, I would also, as is like my favorite topic to talk about these days, but I could go into how we're not really the good guys in this conflict in Ukraine either. And we actually have a lot of responsibility for what's going on there. But the idea that like China um, 
or Russia, for that matter, is going to look at America over the last 20 years and look at how much we've destroyed our image in the world, destroyed our economy, destroyed our own, our own culture by going around the world, invading country after country, getting locked down into quagmires, bleeding ourselves to bankruptcy, and then coming uh, leaving in disgrace. And they'll go, we got to get in on that. That's our new model. Uh, is, is just d- does not seem likely. And here's the other thing. Putin didn't invade Lithuania or Estonia or you know the Baltics which had been part of the Soviet Union and yeah. are much much smaller and far less international have much international clout than Ukraine so if your model is okay let's just assume uh, that he's this just bully dictator who sees a weakness and he's like I'm going to take what I can get he didn't go for the easy targets he went for the big dog number one two and this is one of my favorite bits of, of historical trivia the Molotov cocktail wasn't invented by the Russians. It was invented against the Russians. It was invented by the Finns when this when the when the Czar wanted to conquer or no, it wasn't the Czar. Sorry, when when uh, they wanted to invade Finland, they, the the Finns who are badasses came up with the idea of lighting these kind of gasoline bottles and throwing the troops, and it was against Molotov. Like so, the whole and they they were that. successful. So the idea that like and and these people act as if Afghanistan didn't happen. Like the idea that like, okay, if a country's 175 million, highly educated, highly armed population, that that is going to give a signal to the booger man of China that like, all right, guys, it's it's all open. They can't conquer several uh, places in their own area. And that's not because of us. It's because defense is so much easier than offense. And again, there's just case after case of these big shot countries, including us who thought, we're just going to go in there, put our schlong on the table, they're going to be saying the Pledge of Allegiance in five years, and that's and they're like, no, and that's not what ended up happening. Right. No, absolutely. And I think, you know, to the point you made earlier, that actually, if, if your issue is, because again, all these things get conflated, if your issue is not China's going to conventionally invade us, which I just think is frankly goofy, but your issue is more like they're going to try to, um, you know, um, have kind of this, uh, you know, like spy tactics, try to take sure. over institutions and things like that, which I think is more plausible. And certainly they're yes. already attempting on many levels. It's going to be much more difficult the more decentralized it is. Yeah, they can they can try to take over federal institutions. But let's even say take this national divorce thing and make it closer to like our wet dream where everything is down to like the, the county level or even just like state houses or something like that. They're not going to be able to go take over every single state house. They're not going to be able to take over every single county where the politicians are actually much more directly accountable to the small populations that have have elected them where at least there would be some you know like relationship uh between the community and the people governing over those communities whereas when you get to the level of 300 plus million there's like no relationship at all this is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Pettisey. I love hearing people's stories of resilience and grit. This is why I created this podcast. We are very excited to welcome Jim Gaffigan, Yasmin Mohammed, Glenn Beck, Tim Dillon, Abigail Schreier, Jeff Garland, Ayan Hirsi Ali, Sam Harris, Heather Hying, Jonah Goldberg, Ben Shapiro, Glenn Greenwald, Sarah Shahi, Colin Quinn. If there's a culture of victimhood, then let's Tell stories of grit and survival. Subscribe and listen now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Let's get back to the show. The other one that drives me crazy, which because it's so demonstrably false, is the left. This is always from Boomer Khan. The left is never going to let us alone. And it's like, you. here's how I can demonstrate that's not true. We hear about, you know, I think it was Kentucky is just banning drag shows for children, drag queen story hour in many states mm-hmm. across the country. Not, not no one listening to this, uh, virtually no one knows what they're doing with drag shows in Mexico and kids. No one knows what they're doing with drag kids in Ottawa or trans kids in Ottawa because it's not part of our consciousness. Progressivism is domesticated imperialism, and they're very, very focused on what's going on within their country. But once it's another country, they don't talk about it at all. They don't regard it as their purview. And if they did regard it as their purview, we'd be hearing a lot more about like we have to go liberate Mexico City because they're not being good to LGBTQ kids there, but they don't talk about that in the slightest. And there is a, so it's just, you wouldn't be hearing about it because they would be like, okay, this is out of our control. They wouldn't like it, but their focus would be like, we need to micromanage the places where we have sovereignty over. Yeah, and and I also think that 
you know, if you, when you say progressives will never, you know, leave us alone because they always want to have control over us. It's like, well, who, what do you mean by that? Like, do you mean every, like, do you just mean regular people who vote Democrat? Do you think it's like, how, how many are we talking here? Are we talking a million, five million, a hundred million, you know, like how many people are we talking about here? And if there are, let's say it's 50 million, 50 million people who are that evil that they want to completely dominate your life. Why the hell do you want to share a country with them? Right. Why do you want to be it's like, that seems pretty irredeemable to me. But, also um, the idea but I also so don't have that attitude. I, I also don't have that attitude. I don't think, I think it's these numbers, the numbers are way smaller than, than yep. people think. I think that there's um, social media can kind of create this fun house mirror uh, version of real life where you feel like there's this huge like group of people who want to dominate you or are obsessed with like transing the kids. Whereas in reality, it's, it's, it's a much smaller sliver of Americans who actually feel that way. Some of them are in public schools and in the government and in positions of power and thing, things like that. And that's a big problem. But I, uh, to me, I don't, my idea, at least with the spirit of national divorce, isn't like, Oh, the left half of America is so goddamn evil that I don't want to share a country with them. Or the right half of America is so goddamn evil that I don't want to share a country with them. It's much more like, like the way, like two people who get divorced, but are still friends and like are raising their kid together or something like that, which is far from an ideal situation. But you just go like, this isn't working. This isn't working anymore. This, this being uh, united under one federal government, it's not, it's not working for any purpose that is good. The only thing this is working for is to like enrich special interests, degrade the culture of our society, spend our children into bankruptcy, and provoke Armageddon, quite literally. Uh, you know, that's not good. That's not good. That should be broken up. Here's the other thing is they have this big argument that, you know, they're not going to let us ever leave whoever us is in this conversation and, you know, so on and so forth. It's like there's this presumption. And I think this is a, a relic of conservatives taking L after L after L for decades that they're just going to lose every fight. Because if you ask a conservative, you go, if they had their druthers. Would everyone in America, would handguns be banned? And the answer is, of course, it's not even a question, like, or, or some very strict licensing, you know, whatever, blah, 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 where only, like, if you vote for Biden, you can get a handgun or something crazy. And I'm like, so you acknowledge that they, this is their desire. You acknowledge we're nowhere close to this desire. In fact, gun proliferation is through the roof. Gun sales are through the roof. The percent of Americans who own guns are increasing and disproportionately increasing minorities and females. So clearly your model that what they want is always going to result in what they get is demonstrably false on this very key, very important issue. Uh, they are much more concerned because think about it. If they have this, they have everything else about uh, um, stopping puberty in kids. They're much more concerned about guns because if they take away all these guns, then really, you know, then it's off to the races. So, so people need to ask themselves, okay, why have, and if you're going to say they don't have what they want because the second amendment, until very recently, the Second Amendment has never been used or almost never been used to strike down gun legislation. It's not like some politicians passed it and the Supreme Court's like, you can't do that. Only Heller, which was, I, I think, in the last uh, couple of decades, did they put a break on that. So you had decades where the Second Amendment did jack squat to stop them, and yet they didn't get everything that they wanted. People need to ask themselves, OK, why did that happen? And that demonstrates that your presumption that, well, they're never going to let us go and, you know, they're going to impose their will on us. Well, they're not able to do that now. And is it going to be yeah. easier to defend yourself? It's easier to defend yourself from invasion from a foreign government, D.C., than it is to protect yourself when it's your own government. Yeah, I think I think what you're touching on there is like the most important point of all of this. And I think that I think this was like a, it, it's there's something about kind of the moral of the, the white pill also that. Basically, progressives, one of their their uh, most powerful psychological weapons is that they convince everyone that they are inevitable. Yeah, right. That, and, and when it's you progress, buy into... Progressing you, toward the future. Yes, yeah. right. And when you buy into that, it's that you've already lost the game. This is how they can always say to you, like, we're, you're on the wrong side of history. Right. Very confidently. When they don't even, who the hell do you know what's going to be the right or wrong side of you history? You want to go you back no idea. to the 50s because yes. we're the future. Right. there, and, and so it's this, and this is part of the reason why they really hated Donald Trump. Because Donald Trump almost shook people out of that. They were like, Hillary Clinton's inevitable. 
we've already decided that yeah. she's the next president. And look, they've they've taken several black eyes. Now, that doesn't mean you have to love everything that happened, but you don't have to love Trump or you don't have to love Brexit. You don't have to love Elon Musk buying Twitter. But those were all black eyes for the progressive establishment because all three of them, what they have in common is they weren't supposed to happen. Right. This was not the way it was supposed to go. We were supposed to be trending toward this inevitably. Yep. We're trending toward European um, consolidation. We're yep. trending toward social media, um, you know, like maintaining standards on misinformation and hate speech and all of this. You're not supposed to ever go in the opposite direction. But if you just if you just accept that, that like they they own everything, they own the future and that's it, then, you, OK, you've already lost. But at the same time, you're like, look. National divorce, the idea of the United States of America splitting up sounds kind of crazy. It sounds like a kind of crazy far-fetched thing. Sounds a lot cra less crazy than it did, say, 10 years ago, when you would have literally just been talking about Martians landing and running the government for us. Doesn't sound quite as crazy as that. But you know what? Like, um, giving hormone blockers, to uh, puberty blockers to seven-year-olds sounded really, really crazy not that long ago. The government locking you in your house sounded really, really crazy. There's a lot of things that sound like a really crazy idea, but then they happen. And they even think about, again, however you feel about this, think about the Zionist experiment. Think about how crazy that would have sounded. Just think about like it when they first started talking about it in like the late 1800s and the early 1900s. Like, oh, we're going to go build a Jewish country and this is going to be our homeland and this is going to be. And then they decide we're going to do it in Palestine and all this. This would have sounded like the most insane, far fetched thing ever that you could actually pull this off. But they did it because they had a group of some of committed people who wanted to make it happen and we control the weather. And when you have both of those things together, there's, you can make it rain or sun whenever you want to. And you have, a, you know, and they had people of means and they had, yeah, they had money and they had powerful people, which is also, by the way, something we're going to need to like pull this off. You're going to need to have people, you're going to need to have people with a lot of money and influence and things like this who get on board with the idea. That's the only way, like really anything effectively ever happens. You have to kind of attack yes. it from all angles. You have to have like a, a, a popular kind of uprising. And I mean, peacefully in this case, but a, a, a swelling of kind of populist energy. And then you have to have like kind of a group of elites that get on board with it. At least typically that's how these things happen. But the idea that like something because it sounds far fetched can't happen or that you're guaranteed to keep losing, which is my favorite message of, of the white pill, um, which, of course, everyone listening to this is already read and loved. Um, but it's that the like the idea that it's it's inevitable that like. What? It's inevitable that Maxine Waters outsmarts you at every corner or something like that? Why? And here's, the, here's the thing. I don't trust Ted Cruz as far as I can throw him. And I can very, but you can very easily see a situation where he feels the need to play to the base and for him sure. to start talking about it. Not because he believes in it, but because, look, yeah. I'm, I, I'm in Texas. I got a lot of Texas crazies in the Republican Party. Sure. I'll, I'll, oh, yeah. We need to look at this issue very seriously. But that's at some point, once enough people start talking about it, some people actually start taking it seriously and doing it. And then it's like, wait a minute, what you know, what, what happens now? That's what happened in, um, uh, you know, in Poland, where in, in like 1989, they were like, all right, we have like democracy in the Constitution. Let's take this seriously. And they're like, oh, uh, OK. And it kind of all fell apart. So I, I, it, all it takes is enough sociopath politicians from outsider states meaning whose ideology or population is not at all in line with DC to be like, okay, me talking about this is a great way to raise my national and state plat uh, um, profile. And you're a, a massive way of the, a, a step of the way there, especially when you have the corporate press telling you, you can't do this and you're crazy to even consider it, which was one of the biggest things that got Trump elected when yeah. a lot of people who were like, wait, wait, I'm an American. You're telling me I can't vote for this guy. I can see yeah. why he's nuts, yeah. but you know what? F you, I'm still an American. I'm going to vote for him just to spite you. Yeah. And, and one thing I would just add to that, like, and, and again, I'll like almost caveat in, in saying this in a way that like, it's not this would, if this were to ever actually happen, it would have to be done in the right way. And then yes. have to be that's, and that's very, very important. And also just to like what you mentioned earlier, if this were to just be an exercise in really shifting the Overton window and we settled on some form of like radical decentralization, but it wasn't an actual divorce, like I'd be okay with that too. And like, that would be okay. Maybe not I'll quite as good, but I that's, yes, that's still a lot better. Better than what we currently have going but i would just say that 
if you kind of like really zoom out and look at the bigger picture of like how like an idea like this could come to fruition, like it's very hard, especially with Americans short attention spans to really appreciate the bigger picture of the moment we're living in. And if you were to think about like what really was the result of George Bush and Dick Cheney just being like clearly exposed as people who lied us into a war where something like a million people died and trillions of dollars was wasted and America was disgraced and then creating the the worst you know uh economic recession in, in nearly a hundred years and all of this like what does that mean for us as a yep. country it's very hard in the moment to say then you see Trump is the president and you're like oh <laughs> like that meant a lot you know what I mean like there's there, these things have big and what we've just been through over the last three years which are coming up on it just being three years in this country now yeah was like the, so much crazier than any of that so yeah. much crazier where every the the entire american way of life was completely upended yeah. like there's millions of people were told it's a crime for you to go to work or to have a funeral for your dad or and then they're the like and we'll and and we'll we'll kick you out of your job that you've been doing for 20 years if you don't get this vaccine oh and by the way those lockdowns they didn't work and by the way that vaccine doesn't work and by the way we you know like handed out trillions of dollars to all of our friends and this whole thing is really being exposed like just the, the other day the Department of Energy came out and they're like, yeah, it looks like the lab leak theory was right. You know the thing we were ruining you for last and did you year see what for Dr. saying Dr. Brick it? said? I want to get the exact quote because I, I couldn't believe it because it, 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 this is like something out of Rand. She said that the lab leak origin is plausible and, quote, a good scientist is willing to question their own assumptions. We were told for years, trust the science. Yes, you know, Jimmy yes. Dore was on the show. He had this great bit about like, They've made it so that people who do their own research are stupid. What are you doing? Some reading over there? What are you, oh, we got ourselves a reader here. Hey, folks, look yeah. at this moron. He likes to read. Yeah, it's unbelievable. They mock people. Oh, you think you know better than the institutions? Oh, why? Because you have all of the knowledge of human history available at your fingertips, and now you're going to start looking into it and not just trust the orders coming down from up top. It's a, But the thing is that, like, okay, if there were profound effects from, like, government being exposed in the past – just look at what's already happening and what do you think this the the implications of this over the next few years are i would argue that things that we never thought would be possible yep. will now be possible and that you know that this is like what the enemy class always says like a good crisis is really an opportunity if you spin it right like some henry kissinger or rama Emanuel, like like yep. say stuff like that well that's kind of what we've got here like okay like the the powerful like have really exposed themselves unlike ever before we have alternative platforms unlike ever before. The trust in institutions has crumbled unlike ever before. Maybe now, I'm not saying, I wouldn't like advise, there might be, if there was like a state government right now who is like, we're going to leave the union and I'm going to announce on TV, fuck you federal government, I'm out of here. I might be like, don't do that. Don't, because they might like actually put you down. <laughs> like, I'm not sure they wouldn't right now, but I'd certainly say like, start talking about the idea. Start telling the federal government that, by the way, you reserve the right to leave the union whenever you want to. I think like this, like how exactly this is going to be or this potentially could be um, implemented is still a question mark. But man, it's pretty exciting that people are even thinking about this on like a mainstream level. We're going to continue this conversation because there's a lot more to cover uh, on your show, part of the problem in the very near future. Uh, Dave, we're running out of time. What has been your favorite part of this episode? That dope-ass white pill artwork that you got right behind you. I love it. Thanks, Sal's Famous Official. You are welcome. All month long on Pluto TV, stream the biggest Tyler Perry movies free. Watch your favorites like Medea's Witness Protection and Medea's Big Happy Family. Join Tyler Perry as he goes on a couples retreat with Sharon Leal in Why Did I Get Married? Or Idris Elba and Gabrielle Union in the Tyler Perry directed film Daddy's Little Girls. Plus, Pluto TV has hundreds of channels with thousands more movies and TV shows available on live and on demand. Download the free Pluto TV app on all your favorite devices and start streaming now. Pluto TV. Drop in, watch free.